actually have two questions. Uh, one for to Professor Stone. When you started uh, speaking about the beginning of World War II, it looks like it was only Hitler who started the war. What do you think about actually the role of Stalin and Soviet Soviet uh, Union in this? Because it looked like they both agreed to the peace uh, agreement, and then simply Hitler broke it afterwards. But the beginning was was uh, like a common endeavor of two of two states. And then I would like to ask Professor Hoppe if the, you look to, to, when you have this argumentative ethics, it's, it's very, uh, very, very uh, big improvement into ethical uh, ethics in, in what, we, what we know now. But you always look to restrict it very, very strictly to human beings, while in fact some people, when exploring uh, life of animals, even they saw the, the, that they send some signals and do reflect to those signals and have something similar to a very primitive uh, uh, ownership and and. and that were the primitive uh, property. So how do you comment on this? Thank you. I, I think you, was, you were asking about, um, you know, Russia and the Second World War. Well, I mean, you know, I said Hitler really profited from the this strange gap between the illusion and reality, which was universal in the, between the wars. And that was never more so than in the case of Stalin's Russia. And here was supposed to be a revolutionary regime. Um, and it's offering just tyranny and starvation on an enormous level. Uh, the curious thing is that uh, uh, Stalin himself seems to have known that he was very close, the country was very close to collapse. And so he, he came to terms with Hitler, expecting France to stay alive, afloat, that the war would last in the West as the First World War had done, and therefore he could uh, easily make uh, terms with Hitler in order to uh, uh, stop him attacking Russia. I think Stalin's policy only makes sense in terms of realizing that the Soviet Union was a colossal failure. And in a way, it was Adolf Hitler who created the Soviet Union. You know, if it hadn't been for galvanizing the thing in the Second World War, would it have fallen apart? So it, the Soviet Union is yet another of these well, rubbish heaps, you know, like the League of Nations. <laughs> Sorry, I'm overstating it, but you see what I mean. No, with regards to animals, I think it was perfectly clear. Obviously, they cannot argue with each other. Uh, so whatever I said does not ap apply to them. Um, that we sometimes think that they talk uh, coordinate the actions by signals and so forth is is all a human interpretation of of their behavior. Uh, so, a helpful interpretation sometimes allows us to predict what what they will do and so forth. But um, recall my my initial point was what makes humans humans. Uh, and uh, what makes them different from every other entity in the world is precisely that we can do one thing with each other that we cannot do with any other entity that lives in the world. Uh, I would like to ask the Professor Ronald Stone about the role, of, the role of two prominent figures around that time. One is the impact of Ludwig Wittgenstein on the personal history of uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, there's a theory about him affecting Hitler's becoming of anti-Semites, and I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I want to ask about what do you think about it. And the other question is about Keynes appraisal, or he praised the economic success of the Nazi program around in the 1930s. What do you think about it? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure he, Keynes exactly praised the, the, uh, what Hitler was doing. I mean, obviously, the public spending side of it. But did he, I'm not sure. I mean, Keynes was a man who was very careful. And uh, I, mean, I, don't, I, can't, I don't remember anywhere where he actually talked about it. See, at that time, uh, most people thought that the, the Nazi economic recovery or employment recovery was something owing to armaments. 
There was a book by a, by a Keynesian, a follower of Keynes's called Claude Guillebeau, who was a very straightforward um, Cambridge economist, very, very respected man, and he wrote a book called The Economic Recovery of Germany in 1938, I think. Now, there's a curious side to this, because in 1940, in the invasion scare, the, um, the, the, the British uh, picked up a lot of people whom they suspected of being pro-fascists. Claude Guillebeau had said that the, the Nazi economy would not collapse because of blockade. It was far stronger than that. And um, because of this, and his argument that Hitler had solved the economic problem, the employment problem, simply by Keynesian, or we would call them now, Keynesian public works, because of that, he was quite seriously considered as a as a as, a, as pro-fascist, and he was nearly picked up by and in, interned. In, in H.A.P. Taylor has a wonderful footnote on it that uh, he was he was he was nearly put on trial for this recognition of the truth. Um, now, look, Wittgenstein and Hitler. The, apparently, they did spend a year together at the high school in Linz. And I can't imagine they would have anything to say to each other. I mean, Wittgenstein, the scion of a, uh, of a vastly rich um, family, he didn't know, you know, he was Jewish. He, 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 uh, it, it, uh, I think his sister told him, much later on, you realize we're Jewish pur sang, because what had happened was that in the 1840s, an awful lot of Jews in Austria-Hungary uh, converted because they, you know, they and they couldn't convert to Catholicism because that was even more bizarre than traditional the traditional Judaism. They don't want didn't want to go along with, so they converted to Lutheranism, which was vaguely I mean it was vaguely second rate and you and and they were technically Lutherans. Apparently the Wittgensteins didn't know that they were Jewish until much later on. No, the final point on this is, you know, I, so I don't think we read anything into Wittgenstein and Hitler. Um, one, th the odd thing is that Wittgenstein seems to have been one of the recruiters of the Cambridge spies in the 1930s. Um, now, there we're on to something because he did vanish off to Norway at odd points, and he did, of course, know all these Burgesses and Maclean's, um, uh, as well as having the the um, essential ingredient in the whole thing, namely homosexuality. And, and um, that was, I mean, I was a fellow of Trinity in Cambridge for a bit, and, and uh, Stephen Runciman was the most terrible gossip. And up to here in MI6, he always said it was Wittgenstein was the fifth, was the, the recruiter. Maybe a legend. Just a little thing on Keynes did write a preface to the German edition of the general theory, which came out uh, in the same year as the English edition. Uh, and he did emphasize in the preface that he thought a regime like Nazi Germany would be a far more appropriate place to implement his policies than the liberal Western democracies. Um, so in this sense, I might say he, he did at that time have some sympathy for the German regime, only in the sense I do not know enough about Keynes in order to say more. As far as the Nazi economic recovery is concerned, years ago I gave a speech, I think that is also on the internet somehow available, on uh, comparing uh, Roosevelt's policy to how to get out of the Great Depression with Hitler's policy, how to come uh, out of the Great Depression, and I pointed out that both made huge mistakes from the point of view of uh, Austrian economics, but Hitler did less than, than Roosevelt, and uh, the economic recovery of Germany was far quicker and far more drastic than the recovery, the recovery in the United States, which actually did not happen at all uh, un until the end of, uh, of World War II. Uh, Stefan, from you know, from a libertarian perspective, I think the uh, one of the major criticisms of corporations 
has been their symbiotic relationship with what has come to be known as the corporate state. And this derives, I think, from the role that concentrated economic interests have in directing governmental policy over those with diffused economic interests. And it seems to me that the statists, whether they are of a left or right uh, persuasion, uh, really don't want to criticize the role uh, of the state in directing the society, or particularly in its economic aspects. So in a corporate state system, it seems to be easier for them to condemn just the corporation or just the motivations of the corporation and leaving the state uh, safe, so to speak. Would you comment on that? Well, I, I would say I agree with that completely. Um, and they don't criticize the worst and biggest corporation of all, which is the state, which has corporate status, of course. That's what the modern state is. It's a corporation. Um, it exists even though its members and its administrators come and go. You know, um, so I agree with that, and I agree that the left and the critics of uh, corporatism, as they call it, do focus on corporations instead of on the fundamental issue. Um, of course, I would be in favor of the state stopping its state charter uh, incorporation laws um, and just let the free market operate. I would be even more in favor of the state abolishing itself uh, altogether. Um, so my only point is that in a free society, I don't think that being a shareholder per se uh, should be make you causally responsible for the actions of employees of the company that you have some kind of interest in. Um, but that doesn't mean in some cases they couldn't be. But in any case, I don't believe that someone becoming a shareholder or the lack of uh, the lack of shareholders being fully responsible is you know a contributory cause of the state's power it is the the corporate state alliance but it's, it's not because of limited liability in my view okay. my question goes to professor lin um since you explained how intelligence differences are uh, to be observed uh, between different races. Uh, I was wondering if there is any testable hypothesis or uh, hints um, with respect to what the physiological cause for this could be. Uh, the question concerns how these differences in uh, race differences in intelligence uh, have, a, have appeared. Uh, the generally accepted theory to explain this is that uh, the human, human species evolved in Africa, of course, about uh, 150,000 years ago, in uh, equatorial Africa, in the region of contemporary Kenya and Uganda. Uh, and uh, some of these, uh, some of this population migrated northwards. Uh, first of all into the Middle East and then into Europe and Asia. Now, uh, the, those groups that migrated northwards encountered a more demanding environment. Uh, in particular, the problem of survival over the cold winters. In equatorial Africa, there are plant and insect foods available throughout the year. Whereas, uh, as uh, the, our ancestors moved northwards, there are no plants or insect foods throughout much of the winter and spring. So uh, our ancestors therefore became uh, reliant on hunting large animals for food. And that is more intellectually demanding. Uh, they would hunt animals like horses and deer. These animals run fast. So in order to capture them and kill them, it was necessary for men to go out in groups to devise group hunting strategies, one of which, for example, was to drive a number of these animals into the loop of a river, so the animals were forced to cross the river to escape. But the men would have some comrades on the other side of the river and would club them down as they came out on the other side. So this was a quite intellectually demanding exercise to catch these animals, kill them, and then bring them back to the group. And then there were other intellectually demanding um, problems, 
for survival in the cold climates, like making clothes and shelters and making fires and keeping them going. All these things were intellectually demanding and required a higher intelligence than was necessary in equatorial Africa. So you get a gradient. The most, the most severe climatic conditions were in Northeast Asia, which is why the Northeast Asians evolved the highest IQ. After that, Europe. And then uh, after that, North Africa and uh, Southern Asia. That's the generally accepted explanation today of those of us who work in this area. Uh, if I might add a point, uh, I believe you also had a question as to what were the physiological correlates with the uh, group differences in intelligence. Uh, well, it turns out the brain is probably, well, it's by far the most complex organ in the human body, and there's some estimates that uh, perhaps even half of the genome is involved in the formulation of the brain. So we really don't know the details about how the brain works. But at the gross level, there's an unquestionable connection between brain size and intelligence. And there are definite differences, uh, well established now through all kinds of scientific means, of brain sizes by race, even when you control for body size. And so that North Asians uh, do have a brain that is proportionately larger than that of Caucasians and then blacks. And then I believe it's uh, Australian Aborigines have the smallest brains, is that correct? Uh, That's right. So this is a, again, this is a very gross uh, surface level uh, physiological correlate for intelligence, but it is something that differentiates intelligence within races, within families, and also between races. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, Stefan, I'd like to thank you for such um, a, a clear overview of the dispute over corporations and for such a fair exposition of the views of those who do not agree with you. However, I am not convinced by your analogy with the um, sale of the gun. If I am a gun manufacturer, or better than that, if I'm a gun seller, and, and I sell a gun to him over there, and he takes it off and shoots somebody, then his will, his decision to commit that crime is a new intervening cause. It breaks the nexus between my um, initial possession of the gun, or my manufacture of the gun, and the criminal act. It, it is an entirely different matter, however, if I, as a sole proprietor, let's leave aside uh, corporations for the moment, it is an entirely different matter if I, as the sole proprietor of a company, employ a van driver to make deliveries for me, and, and the van driver has an accident and injures somebody or destroys some valuable property. The van driver himself may well be without assets, but the van driver is acting on my instructions in my time. He is in small matters over the uh, decision whether to turn left or right to stop and put the handbrake on, etc. He is in small matters clothed with my authority. And if he has an accident, and even leave aside whether I have been negligent in my employment of the man, in my training of the man, and in my choice and maintenance of the van. Forget, leave aside those matters for a moment. If he does cause a, an accident, I must surely be held partly responsible for his actions. Now, I do agree that the doctrine of vicarious liability has been carried too far, certainly in England and probably in America, we can both think of the cases. But I do think it, nor, I think it just plain common sense that if someone is acting in <coughs> my time about my business, clothed with my authority, and he commits a tort for which he cannot, through his own assets, um, compensate a victim, then I should be held responsible. And if that, is the if that is the case for me as a sole proprietor, then it is surely the case for me and for my fellows as a shareholder. I, I find it very difficult to believe otherwise than that. You your claim that ownership does not imply responsibility strikes me as uh, perverse. But um, 
I put that to you. I could say more, but this is a question, not a reply. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, Joe Becker did call to my attention. I did make a mistake with the Smith & Wesson example. I, I gave examples of a rental car where the ownership is retained and a stolen knife where the ownership is retained. The gun example should have been the theft or the lending of a gun. I was trying to, I was trying to ex show cases where I think we would all agree that mere ownership by itself doesn't imply responsibility, which is a type of strict liability theory which you're sort of adopting here. I might be persuaded in the sole proprietorship case, but the reason you initially gave that the sole proprietor is responsible wasn't because of ownership. It had nothing to do with ownership. It was because he was directing and controlling the actions of the employee, right? So you say these phrases, he's going about my business, or he's cloaked with authority, which is I don't know if that's question begging or circular or metaphorical, but we have to we have to ask the question, do we have a clear theory of causality that means that just because you're a shareholder, so the, the part I would disagree with you on is going from the argument that if the supervisor of the employee is liable, then surely the shareholder is. I don't, because the only surely there, the only reason to make that statement surely is because the shareholder is the owner. And again, if we say, if we, in the classic case of ownership, we're talking about what we're used to every day. I own a car. I have the right to control it. Uh, a shareholder really is called an owner by the state, but that's just a legal classification. Uh, as I said, the shareholder can't use these, these objects directly. They don't have the right to supervise the employees. So my reason is that a shareholder, by virtue of merely being a shareholder, I mean, we could make up another word for it. Instead of calling, so calling a shareholder or owner, we could say this guy is someone who... Uh, has the right to elect directors and the right to receive dividends. That's really all he has, the right to elect shareholders and the right to receive dividends. He doesn't have the right or the authority or the power to control the actions of the corporation, to even choose its policy or direction, or especially to select and hire employees. I mean, by your theory, a manager who supervises an employee wouldn't be liable because he's not an owner. So if you're going to link it with ownership, then that's really all that matters. And then we, we get to the point where instead of a classic form of ownership where you own a, your home or a car or a gun, um, now we're letting the state or some lawyer or some legal theorist arbitrarily analogize and say, well, the guy that invested money in this company and has the right to elect directors, we're going to call him an owner. So now he's going to be responsible like an owner would. I think the, the theory of causation has to... Uh, has to go back to actions performed by the person and how he is uh, acting in concert with somehow the person who committed the tort. So I would say a manager of the corporation who directs the actions would be liable under your theory, and I would agree with that, if, whether he's the owner of the corporation or not, you know, the direct supervisor of the negligent employee. He could be liable. Maybe the board of directors could because they set policies and they hire the officers. But the reason they're all liable is because of their actions and their supervision of the employees. I don't see that shareholders have that right to supervise. They're passive. So that's my reason that I don't agree with your last step. Who owns British Petroleum? I think ownership for the libertarian simply means the legally recognized right to control a scarce resource. Okay? So to the extent that has normative implications, then we're talking about really sort of a, a legal factual situation, not what the state classifies things as, not how the common law rules have evolved to distinguish between a leaseholder and a fee, a fee holder and, and whatever. So for example, I would say under libertarian principles, if I own a house and I, let's say I rent it to you for a week, now you have a contractual type of property right for that week. I don't have the right to come in and kick you out. So at that moment in time, for that week, you are, under libertarian theory, the owner of the home, not me. Now I'm going to retain my ownership at the end of the week. Now lawyers have complicated classification schemes for other purposes, but then that's kind of hijacked, and the state's classification scheme is hijacked uh, for other purposes. It's, it's like a type of uh, equivocation in a way, really. So I think ownership just means the legally recognized right to control. There are gradations of it in the law that's useful, but it's not useful for, I think, this causal responsibility analysis. Um, I have a question for Professor Hubbard. Um, 
How has 9-11 and the government's reaction to 9-11, and especially the people of the West, the masses, their reaction to the government taking away their liberties, how has that affected your opinion on the prospect for a libertarian social revolution? I, I, I didn't understand the end of your question. So how, how did that affect what? Okay. I will uh, rephrase the question. On my way over here, I listened to one of your old lectures called How America Can Be Saved. And it's, I think it was before 9-11, that lecture. And you sounded very optimistic about the prospect for a social revolution, a libertarian social revolution. Um, so the question is, did 9-11 and the things that has happened after 9-11 affect that? I, I think when I gave that speech, uh, I think it was a speech before donors. If you give speeches before donors, you tend to be always a little bit more optimistic than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but for, for obvious reasons. Um, and um, uh, so I think I was then not all that optimistic, uh, and I have become less optimistic since. Yeah, I want to ask uh, Jared Taylor what he thinks of uh, libertarian anarchism in the Rothbardian Hoppian tradition. What I think of libertarian anarchy in, in what tradition? Rothbardian. In the Rothbardian tradition. Well. Uh, I think that uh, the founding of the United States was based on a deep suspicion of centralized government. And uh, I share that uh, deep suspicion. Uh, I live uh, close to Washington, D.C., as I often say, so that uh, I can keep the enemy in my crosshairs at all time. Uh, I think that uh, I am uh, fundamentally a libertarian, but uh, the one aspect of uh, doctrinaire libertarianism that I do not and cannot support is the notion that borders should be abolished. I think that uh, privatization of uh, most things, perhaps all things, uh, is a desirable thing. I think that charity should be voluntary and not obligatory. I think uh, all of the aspects of the welfare state have contributed to all sorts of degeneracy. But uh, again, where I part company with uh, those who are libertarian across the board is that I do believe that borders are necessary to preserve a kind of functioning homogeneity without which a society can descend into a kind of chaos. Um, yeah. The immigration question is, of course, under dispute among libertarians themselves. So, so I do not take this open border position that some um, some libertarians do take. And let me explain why. Um, the, reason, uh, the reason why there exist, so to speak, borders of the United States, borders of Germany, and so forth, is, uh, this, uh, is the fact that the state in Germany, the state in the United States, has, of course, uh, forced people uh, to contribute taxes to building building roads, building facilities here and there. Um, so we can say, yes, Americans own America in the sense that American taxpayer money has been used to build all facilities in the United States. And it is their genuine property and those people of course do have a right to determine who comes in and who doesn't come in. The current regime is very imperfect because the state assumes this type of control. But of course private individuals owning private roads, owning private facilities and so forth, they would do exactly the same. They would also control who has access to what type of resources. And the question that we always have to ask, this is, I think, the mistake of those people who are in favor of open borders among libertarians, that they think public property, so to speak, is unowned property. But it is not unowned property. It is property that has been financed 
by certain people in the United States. Not all people in the United States have financed them. Obviously, uh, state employees themselves have not financed them. Obviously, welfare recipients have not financed them. But there exist, of course, masses amount, massive amounts of people who have actually financed them, and they do have the right to stop people if they don't like them to come. Um, so public property is not unowned property that is, stands open to be uh, occupied, homesteaded, and so forth by foreigners. And that there is a difference between the United States citizens and foreign, foreign citizens can be simply seen in, have Indians, for instance, contributed to American streets being built? And the answer is uh, no, they haven't. So certainly they do not have the right to travel on American roads unless they are invited by Americans. Uh, have Germans contributed whatever um, uh, roads in, in China? Uh, there might be some Germans who have contributed to Texas. <laughs> Again, via Texas and so forth, and them I would grant a right to access those places that they have actually financed. But by and large, it is the Chinese that have done that. By and large, it is the Germans that have created things in Germany, and it's Americans who have created America. So yes, they have the right to discriminate against foreigners and let certain people in and exclude others. Yeah. How about the German financed uh, roads in Greece and Spain? They shouldn't work? Yeah, 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 yes, then of course the Germans have the right to access those roads. <laughs> yes. I have a very fundamental question to, to Hans, but also for the, the other members here. It goes on human nature, and I remember a lot of discussions we had on natural law and human nature years before, and I agree more than ever uh, what you uh, said today. But it leads, uh, you ha we have to argue and to argue and to find arguments for arguments, and, uh, but it leads back to, to the fundamental question uh, which one position is taken by Rousseau on one side, that the man is born free and good by nature. And on the other side, we have the story of the Old Testament, that uh, man is corrupted by original <coughs> sin. I don't like the term, but uh, I like the act that Eve took the apple and that after eating the apple and sharing it with her husband, thank you, uh, that uh, uh, mankind is able to find out the difference between good and evil. And this is the starting point to decide. And uh, what is more important than the decision to bear the consequences. So I think uh, Eve, uh, by taking and eating and sharing the apple, is the mother of liberty. Uh, and we should be grateful for that. But uh, uh, it's the opposite uh, position than uh, Rousseau had. So what's, what's your preference, more Rousseau or more Eve? If you, if, if you put it this way, of course that we were expelled from the Garden of Eden then implied that we have, have to live in a world of scarcity. Um, and only in a world of scarcity uh, do we develop ideas, uh, uh, try to become intelligent, uh, because only intelligence will uh, guarantee a success in a world of scarcity. In a world of superabundance in the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't even have to do much thinking, if anything at all. Uh, all we would have to do is just grab apples and shove them into our mouths. Um, so in this sense, I. Um, I'm on the side of Eve uh, as having initiated the cognitive development of men. And part of the cognitive development of men is, of course, also the idea of, uh, of freedom and of justice and from good and bad and so, and so forth. Let me just uh, emphasize, I did not, my, my lecture did not, not imply that man is good or bad. 
uh, what it what it implied was that we can distinguish between good and bad, between right and wrong. Whether we always do it is something uh, is a matter that is completely different. Um, when I criticized Hobbes by saying, "Look, people who say that." one man is another man's wolf, I did not uh, imply by that that men are not sometimes wolf-like, uh, that they beat other people, kill other people, and so forth. But you cannot say that man is only a wolf, uh, because that is contradicted by the very fact that you formulate that in a sentence, that you present that as an argument, and that indicates that you are also something else different, entirely different from a wolf. Uh, by the way, the translation of Eve is life. Okay. I have a question for Jared Taylor. Uh, I, for me, the pivotal point of your presentation uh, was your observation, which is obviously correct, that there's, starting somewhere in the 1950s, there's been a sea change uh, in, in racial perceptions. Um, what, uh, before this change, before this watershed, was perceived as ordinary, uh, as acceptable discourse, uh, would now be dismissed as outrageous racial slurs. It seems to me, however, that the, uh, this, the, the, there is a non sequitur or some kind of implicit assumption in the implications you, that you draw from this, uh, uh, from this sea change. Um, that um, it, the present situation is um, a, a degenerative one in that uh, the natural state, as shown by our, our history of racial relations, is either um, strife and oppression or segregation. And this is how things must be. And, if, and any attempt to negate this reality is going to, going to re result in, 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 in tragedy. Um, Perhaps I can use a thought experiment to, to get my point across. If we can imagine uh, Jared Taylor living in the um, late 18th century, the early 20th century, uh, or, sorry, uh, late 18th or early 19th century, he would presumably point to the Americans and say, well, you know, what they are doing is a denial of human history. Uh, what they are saying, the Americans, is that there can be cooperation amongst competing religious groups. The whole history of religious, of religious difference is, uh, relig uh, is a history of murder and oppression. And um, what, the, what, what the Americans are saying is that, uh, in fact, different religious uh, groupings can live together and horror of horrors perhaps even respect each other. Um, surely the message, why can't you see this sea change as a positive development, as one more instance where America has been a beacon of light to show that what has undoubtedly been bad in the past can be overcome and we can come to a, a new era in which we can overcome these, uh, th these bigotries. If your point is that, uh, as, as a matter of historical fact, uh, we are a bigoted and murderous species, um, I would have some sympathy with that view. If, however, your point is that this is how we ought to be or this is how we, we, we naturally are, I would question it. Ah, very interesting question. <clears throat> Uh, it reminds me of the great vogue, of course, that Marxism had for a very, very long time. The idea of the classless society, the idea of uh, a society that would abolish selfishness, and one in which uh, we would live from each according to his ability to each according to his need. I think uh, that was an extremely seductive one one that attracted people for many years, but the result, of course, we all know. The result was all kinds of catastrophe. I believe that Marxism essentially failed because it was a misreading of human nature. It might be better if we lived in a world where there was no selfishness, where we really could create uh, Marx's new man, but I just don't think in our far fallen state that is, that is something that's possible. The United States today, and I think uh, most European nations, has embarked on this notion of building a nation in which race can be made not to matter. And I think that the civil rights bargain of the United States of the 1960s was very much the idea that we whites who have been dominant, 
we will dismantle our racial consciousness. We will dismantle any attempt to think in terms of our group interests with the expectation that every other group would do likewise. The trouble is, no other group has done so. And so in the United States, it is only whites who are not allowed to defend their racial interests, whereas every other racial group does so. And it is one thing to be an optimist in an entire society of optimists, or to share idealism with others who are equally idealistic. But this experiment of unilateral disarmament, if you will, is one that I think sufficient data have come in to show that so far, and I see no reason to see this change, it is only whites who have approached the racial question with this kind of goodwill and expectation of reciprocity. And given this situation, we have today one in which, as you say, whites are trying to build this world that will transcend race, but no one else is doing so. And unless whites realize that this fallen nature of man, just like the selfishness that Marxism tried to abolish, this is part of our nature. I think it is always better to build a society on a correct understanding of human nature rather than an illusion. The uh, uh, American politician uh, Adlai Stevenson once said that uh, given a choice between disagreeable fact and agreeable fantasy, Americans will go for the fantasy every time. Well, I think the idea of building a race in which race can be made not to matter is a very agreeable fantasy that has captured the imagination of large numbers of people. But I think the data are in that this must require the same thinking in all groups, and we are not at that point, and I don't believe we ever will be. I beg your pardon? Ah, we, well. had, we, had the, 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 we had the historical example of religious hatred, right. which can be overcome. Yes, yes. Um, and, oh. it had, and it was not overcome because all religions said, oh no, and we will now tolerate everybody. It was, it, was, it, was, it was overcome because of libertarian principles which are at the founding, uh, which are the founding of, 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 the, of, of the American state. I would agree with you that the abandonment of these libertarian principles, and uh, I'm not a Marxist incidentally, but, and I would agree with everything you said about Marx, except the idea that Marxism lead, would lead in a, in, uh, it has a fantasy of a better world. Marxism is a vicious uh, uh, ideology in its, in its own right. Um, the respect, the, the, the respect of, other, of, of other races, just like the respect of other religions, is not beyond uh, human achievement. Perhaps mm. it might prove to be because we are fall we're fallible species, but to suggest that it ought to be is to me frankly outrageous. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that it ought to be. I think uh, there are differences between men and women. Uh, should these di differences be ignored? Should, they be, should we try to minimize these differences? I think, again, we have to accept things as they are. As for this thought experiment, oh, I'm, I would certainly agree that uh, our species has made all kinds of progress in terms of setting aside sources of conflict, organizing society in ways that are more fair, ways that are more productive. It's just that I brought up the question of Marxism because I think simple idealism is not the solution. Idealism can bring us into new vistas, it's true, but idealism that is misdirected can lead us to catastrophe. And in the case of the whole racial situation today, I fear that ultimately in the long term, whites, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well, are being displaced by others. And for the first time in history, a majority population is not merely permitting itself to be displaced by others, but has convinced itself that to resist this displacement is somehow evil. That, to me, is contrary to human nature. And unless this revolt against human nature, this revolt against a sense of community is somehow brought to an end, in the long term, our race will, will, will disappear. And I think of that as, as I said in my concluding remarks, a real tragedy. Okay, I need a signal from Hans now. We've got six more people on the list. Okay. Uh, Stefan, I agree with your assessment a lot. I, uh, I, I, and I, you made two points there. 
One was the latter point with respect to liability, tort. The first one was in the attack, the assault on the corporation, as you called it, which I find it more frightening. And this quote that the corporations are basically um, instruments of the state because they've been licensed by the state. But I, I, I like to challenge you in one thing, though, in that there needs to be some ethical and moral components into this, because primarily this issue is an American one. To some extent, it's British. He asked you who owns British Petroleum. The answer is every pension fund in Britain. The very same people that they expect some, some equity. But um, the problem is strictly American, because American law has become really an yeah. instrument of extortion. This does not this is not true in other parts of the world. Even in France or a lot of other places, the liability of the corporation can be easily met through insurance policies. And there's no tort in the sense that the larger the corporation, the larger the damage. Some jury of peers, you know, goes after it with envy, etc. These things don't exist. Um, so the corporation is not under attack, say, in Europe that I'm very familiar with in any sense. It is in the sense of taxation and regulation as it is in the US. But I would like to suggest to you that um, the issue of corporate ownership, the reason corporations are rudderless is because there's no essence of ownership any longer. In fact, they're not in America, they call them stakeholders now, in, in lieu of stockholders or owners. And when you abrogate the element of ownership, you abrogate the sense of responsibility. And without responsibility, you have an amorphous entity that is rudderless, and then the system, a, system, a legalistic system, tends to attack it and destroy it. There are no strong owners anymore, they're renters. So I think a lot of it is possibly, Guido Hiltzman referred to it as a symptom of the age of credit. The age of credit, the access to credit, the ease to which, with credit and with borrowings, you can actually try to acquire wealth, so to speak, or capital, or grow. Um, has contributed to this effect, the, this, this whole idea of, um, of um, the, the relationship between the state and the corporations, as the, the idea of corporatism that others have suggested. So I think it's a symptom of a money issue, um, this legalism and this legal extortion that's taking place. And I was wondering if you ever thought about that ethical and moral antecedents to this problem, rather than just looking at it from a corporation, which is truly only American, frankly. Well, I think I agree with, uh, I'm glad you asked this because I wanted to follow up on Sean's because I, I did fail to complete my answer about BP. Um, I agree with most of what you say. Um, corporations in America, especially the large ones, especially um, the, the big pharmaceutical industry, uh, Hollywood, the movie industry, um, uh, the music industry, some parts of the software industry uh, heavily lobby the state, for example, to foist our fascist patent and copyright laws on, on the rest of the world. So they're implicated in the state, but that's only because of the state's existence, of course, and uh, the, a big pig trough is going to draw pigs. Uh, on the other hand, states are craven, I mean, corporations are craven and gutless, partly because the state has so much power over them. Uh, if you just look at the regulations on public corporations with Sarbanes-Oxley and these rules, the extortion, the taxes, and just the very fact that the state claims the right to give them life and grant their charter and then claims the right to regulate them in response and has created this notion of stakeholders, which for people who don't know, is this amorphous new leftist kind of doctrine that it's not only the, the legally classified owners, the stockholders that have the right to control the corporation, but it's everyone who has a stake uh, in the corporation, which would be you know, the local community, uh, et cetera. So you have all these environmental activists and people like this that uh, the corporations are you know, kissing their rear ends by trying to appease them and not doing anything too bold um, because they don't want to lose their charter or be sanctioned by the state or be penalized or fined. So it leads to, it does lead to corporatism. And uh, I agree that. Um, uh, to the extent that state intervention and even corporate intervention with the state and getting in bed with the state, to the extent it has led to a distorted business field or a distorted economy, um, I think we should abolish the corporation to get rid of these distortions and maybe we would have a different corporate structure, a different corporate scene. My focus here, of course, was 
on whether or not the grant of limited liability is really a cause of all this. And I don't, I don't, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 was, I agree with you on that. I don't disagree that that is probably a much bigger effect in the first place to the way corporations act is the, you know, the, the, the financial interventions that the state basically causes. I don't disagree with that. On the question of ownership, this may be a little uh, libertarian in the weeds, but the reason I focused on ownership uh, is because if you, so Sean asked who owns BP, and I gave the example of a, a house. The question for the libertarian is simply, as I said, the legally, who owns the right to control a resource? Okay, so in the case of BP, at any moment in time, there are certain managers in place and the board members who have the right to uh, direct the actions of the employees, who have the right to allow access to the tangible equipment and, and capital that the corporation owns. So in a sense, those are the shareholders at a given moment in time. I'm sorry, those are the, sorry, those are the owners Okay, so if we want to determine ownership, the question is who has the right to control this resource? And by agreement of the shareholders, they do. But if you're going to say because the state calls the shareholders owners, then they're the true owners, and we, we've already determined that ownership, because it means the right to control something, the right to direct the control of something, implies liability, now we're sort of equivocating because we're shifting to the state just saying these guys are owners. But really, let's just look at what they are. They have the right to receive dividends. They have the right to elect directors. All that means is a very vague, uh, small effect on who the directors are. It just means the right to receive a financial benefit from the corporation. Lots of people do this. Quite often bondholders, quite often creditors, have agreements with the corporation on who's going to be on the board of directors. So are we going to establish a rule that anyone who has any influence whatsoever on who the board members are, what corporate policy is, anyone who gets a financial benefit from a corporation, like a customer, uh, is, we could call them owners too, but because they have some of the same characteristics that shareholders have. So I, that is why I brought this point up. I mean, imagine a restrictive covenant, which is an example I gave. You have a neighborhood of 100 people. They all agree when they move in, usually by a master plan of the original builder, they agree that they will abide by a, a veto, effectively, of their neighbors on certain uses of their property, like you can't paint your house orange or you can't put a pig form in your yard. Okay, who's the owner of my house in such a neighborhood? Well, I'm the 99% owner, and my neighbors own 1% in a sense. They have a, a partial right of control. They have the right to tell me not to use it for a certain purpose, not to build a pig farm um, on my property. I have the rest of the right. It's divided by contract. Now, there are perils of dividing by contract, as people point out. You know, you, you have a more amorphous responsibility. But usually in a contract, you're going to have at any moment in time just like the rules for private property in a free society, this is the entire purpose of political theorizing, is to come up with a set of rules that answer the question at any moment in time, not in the future, who has the right to control this scarce resource right now? And the, the first political question, the libertarian principles that Professor Hoppe talked about, determines what person or group of people have the right over this resource. And then internally to that group of people, they have a, a web of contracts that specify who among them has the right. And that's what you have in a corporation, and that's what you have in a restrictive covenant, that's what you have in a partnership, that's what you have when two people buy a car together or buy a condo in Aspen together, and they agree that you can use it on these weeks and I can use it on these weeks. So ownership is relevant when we want to determine that question. Um, how we get people to act morally and ethically um, in such a situation is beyond my pay grade, but I don't think the state should encourage it by interfering with corporations or even with chartering them. So I agree that they should abolish that, but let the free market operate. Um, I would like to ask um, Mr. Stone what he thinks about uh, two historical works uh, on the Second World War, um, in the case that you have studied them. Uh, the first is, um, which was published uh, about a year ago uh, by Ho Herbert Hoover, uh, Freedom Betrayed, uh, which puts forth the thesis that the intervention of the United States in the Second World in, into Europe um, 
prolonged the, the Second World War, and if they wouldn't have intervened, uh, the Soviet Union and the National Socialists would have would have destroyed each other, and um, and it would have been fav favorable to the United States, of course, and also to the outcome of the Second World War. And the second work is uh, by Anthony Sutton. Uh, it's called Wall Street and Hitler. And in case you know it, what, what your opinion is of these two works. Thank you. Uh, and let, let me take the second question first. Uh, the, I, I read about the book rather than read it. You know, there were, it goes back a long way to say that um, that capitalism caused Hitler. It had uh, obvious origins in Germany, where people say that uh, the, the capitalists went along with Hitler. Well, you know, <coughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's in a sense true, but it was investigated quite a long time ago by a man called Henry Allen Turner, who um, looked into all this, and the capitalists had to hedge their bets in Germany. You know, they, they, they preferred the, the, the National Liberal Party, the People's Party as they called it, hedged their bets with the Catholics and only really came along to, to, uh, to start supporting Hitler when he was already winning. And Tucson wrote his, his memoirs about that before you know, fleeing. I mean, after all, you know, capitalism, capitalists have to protect their, their positions as, and everybody else did. Um, you know, there's, I'm never terribly impressed by these, uh, you know, these uh, American conspiracy theories that uh, Gore Vidal came up with, one which was quite well documented that somehow uh, Roosevelt was, uh, you know, was, was prodding Hitler into war. Now, of course he was. Um, he, it's, uh, Hitler solved all sorts of problems for him in the end. Um, because he, you know, he was he was uh, attacking. Well, his men were attacking uh, uh, American ships, and you know somehow there's a, a strain of American thought which I never understand quite. That somehow this was this was Roosevelt's fault, not uh, not Hitler's for actually attacking. Now, poor old Herbert Hoover, he's he's a, he's, he's an exceedingly interesting man. Um, he, you know, he's one of these very characteristic American figures of the 1920s. He did a huge amount of good in Belgium, from saving it from starvation. Repeated that feat in the, in uh, the Soviet Union, and when he, you know, he 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 spent a huge amount of money saving the Soviet uh, saving Russian peasants from starving in 1922, 1923. But his experience, and, and you know, it's to that that we owe the Hoover Library in Stanford, which is a fabulous institution, because he said, uh, you know, the way to pay me back is give me czarist government documents. So it was, it was for a long time the leading institution before the Soviet archives started opening. It was to the Hoover Institution that you went for books and papers. I owe it a lot, right, because I wrote about Russia in the, Eastern, in the First World War. Now, uh, he's that that kind of can-do mentality, but he he emerged from all of that with a hatred of the Soviet Union. You know the the uh, the I think the statutes of the Hoover Library are that this money is given to demonstrate the falsity of the doctrines of Karl Marx. I'm literally quoting. I think that's the the foundation of it. He went in with Hansen. And Hansen's the, the great Norwegian, and Hansen's assistant in that case was a certain Major Quisling, who was uh, the you know who, who uh, was the Nazi collaborator in Norway during the war and was executed for it, again out of hatred of the Soviet Union. Now you see, when Hitler and when uh, Roosevelt ended up in alliance with with uh, with Stalin, somebody like Hoover so totally unnatural. But why can't we just stay out of it and let them uh, let them um, let, let, let them bash each other to bits? Well, the answer is that somebody would have won, um, and uh, you know that would not have you know an isolated America. Already, already. I mean, Hoover's. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking much too much, but um, I'll shut up. <laughs> 
but uh, it, 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 Hoover himself must have known that the tax, the tax rises he made in 1932 and his policy of, let, of closing down, after all, closing down 6,000 banks in the middle of a slum is crazy and putting up taxes is also crazy. Um, that uh, he must have realized that his policies had something to do with the depth of the depression, which Roosevelt, whom he hated, was very successful in overcoming. So his way of getting back was to, was for this man, great man, man of prodigious achievements and all that, is to come up with these sad theories that Roosevelt somehow bought by the Jews to, to, you know, to play up Stalin and play down Hitler and so on and so forth. It's a great pity because you know, the world owes him a lot, and it just went wrong. The last question. Okay, to, my question is for Stefan Kinsella and maybe Professor Hopper, if he would like to add something on this. Uh, I was a little bit confused after your presentation and after your answers to the questions. I'm, I'm con con confused more about the subject. Uh, when you uh, said that ownership on, is only for scarce resources. I'd like to ask how a corporation is a scarce resource and is it really possible to own a corporation? And in fact, if you challenge your definition of shareholder ownership, in fact, it fits to the copyright owner exactly. And how is it possible that shareholders own a corporation which does not physically exist and is it possible to own a shareholder or they're just in contractual obligation with the founders or whoever it is? Sure. Um, well, I was actually kind of disputing the common notion, the state classification, the shareholders are owners of the corporation. And it's, it's considered in the law to be an owned thing because it's a, it has a legal personality and the state treats that as a, a type of ownable thing. Um, from my point of view and from the point of view of libertarians, when you talk about who's the owner of the corporation, the question really is who's the owner of the scarce resources that the corporation owns. So 10 people come together, put their money together, and by a contract between them, they agree what's going to be done with it. You know, that money's going to have an administrator, a manager, it's going to be used to purchase certain real assets which are scarce resources. You know, a building, capital goods, and then it makes money. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a convenient legal fiction. It's, it really would have no owner. I would agree in a free market, a corporation doesn't even exist as a legal entity. That's why I disagree with the entity theory. So it's just a way of, of conveniently saying who owns these resources. You know, like let's say you have the McDonald's building. So then the question is who owns that building? Well, it's really 17 co-owners if 17 people came together to form a corporation. They just own it through the mechanism of what they call a corporation. And they adopt the common name just like a trade name just to deal with the public and to make it easy to, for people to know who they're dealing with. But really, you're right, corporations do not have a, a scarce, you know, they're not a scarce resource. It's just the means by which real people own scarce resources, which are the physical assets owned by the corporation, including the money that it makes, the profits that it makes, the products that it generates. Okay, so we're really talking about ownership of the scarce resources, including the trucks and the things that are used. These are scarce means used by actual employees to commit torts. So we're always talking about scarce means. So th that's what the whole dispute is about. And then the question Sean asked about ownership, uh, what I'm pointing out is that there's a distributed form of ownership. Some shareholders have a claim, some bondholders have a certain claim and a certain influence. Board of directors have a certain claim, all by virtue of the structure set forth in a contract between a number of people. So we're talking about ownership of the scarce resources owned by the corporation. If it has no resources, it's worth nothing. So really, that's the ultimate question.